I mean, we should probably just get into it, but it's uh, kind of a fun topic because it asks the question of why again, like, why did we, why did I start this business? Totally. That's the challenge, right? Well, uh, Emmett, when behind the scenes, whenever you turn off the, uh, the main title, I'll, uh, I'll kick us off. All right, Tim. So you, you just, I think I just heard you say, this is fun. This okay. is fun. Yeah. I'm like, don't, yeah, no, there, there's no version under which the subject of taxes and finances was fun, at least for someone like me, because I always fancied myself a creative guy, right? Much more sales and biz dev and creative. So for me, this topic is not awesome at all. So I get to be the curmudgeon today. And you're going to be the smart consultant that's going to answer all these problems, right? I love it. And I don't want to anyone to misunderstand what I'm saying. What a fun, like, I don't think taxes are any more fun than the rest of you. What what started this conversation and kicked it off is next Thursday is the end of the filing extension for corporations. So there are some of the clients that we're going through that are trying to meet that deadline. And by meeting that deadline, we're working with creative entrepreneurs who are doing taxes for this next two weeks, instead of doing what they wanted to do for a living. And that always seems to be the entrepreneurial crisis. Like, did I start a creative firm or do I have to jump through all these business items, taxes, finance, hiring people, you know, things that we talk about in the weekly briefing. Um, But what is it like to really be a creative entrepreneur opposed to that dream job you thought you were getting to? Yeah. Um, Well, look, let me, let me, let me back up a step and just say, Welcome everyone officially to this week's weekly briefing. I'm Joel, this is Tim, and my my calendar says today is Thursday, September the 8th. What do we do every week in the weekly briefing? For those of you that are new here, we pick a hot topic, a trend, something new, something going on in the industry that we feel owners are either already talking about or they should be talking about. And Tim, this probably falls more into the should category, should category, right? right? Because we don't want to talk about the taxes and so forth. And if you're not in the States, maybe your tax filing dates are different. So we get that. But I will say this overall, Tim, it is perhaps good news that there can be a strategy for not only the finance ingredient, you know, overall, but even how we manage taxes and so forth. So what are some of the pain points that you're hearing from business owners out there. And for those of you listening, if you have a question, comment, whatever, feel free to drop something in the chat and we'll we'll get into it real time. Yeah. So so I guess we all know that there are the, the ugly part of running a business, the business part of running it. And like we said, like I said beforehand, taxes is just one of them. It's the thing you're focusing on this week or next week. Um, sometimes finances is like, you know, I'm running out of money. So to recognize the need for sales, to hiring a consultant sometimes can be ugly. Not if you're hiring us, but other consultants, they're very ugly. No, I'm just kidding. But there are just the business part of running the business that we didn't really sign up for, or we didn't think we signed up for when we started our business. And that entrepreneurial crisis is something that I feel we're doing all the time. And if we're honest, it's not really why we started our business. We often thought like, oh, I'm going to be a creative person, a creative director. And Joel, I think that's when you started your business, you thought, I love doing this creative thing. Why don't I start my own business, take the risk, hire some employees and grab some, indep- make, you know, have, steal some independence along yeah. the way and have some control over my career. Um, and then one or two days later, you find out like, oh, I have to open a bank account or you have to kind of start the business part of it. Yeah, I had to go get a federal taxpayer ID number, right, for that business in order to open a bank account. And I think in a way, part of the journey is that as business owners, when we're starting, this is all exciting and it's amazing because, right, we're finally making the money that we feel like we've deserved and we're able to hire people and money means, means resources. And then we become a, somewhat of a victim of our own success and smart people like bookkeepers and accountants or CPAs start showing up uh, probably later than they should have because we have something happen called hey, the government uh, needs to be paid and it's a lot more complicated now. And you bring in these experts and they tell you, yeah, you need to do this. You need to do that. And remember you were telling me the story, Tim, of remember the days when you always had a line out your door as Joel, the business owner at Impossible, 
And there's people outside their door lined up asking you questions that I don't know the answers to, but it's like, somebody has to answer this thing called, were quarterly payments made? And was this thing filed? And right, our federal versus state and workforce comp and all this. And I'm like, I don't know. I just work here. I thought I was a creative. Yeah. Or oh, and somebody has to figure it out. And if no one else around you is willing to figure out your, uh, those 2 a.m. issues, you're staying up at 2 a.m., reading some website, filing some paperwork, arguing with your wife, whatever that thing is, in order to get past that stress moment of like, why isn't it happening? Where, where is this coming from? You're hitting way too so, close to home now. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> well, but let, there, me, let, yeah, me ask the, let me make this point, because I will say, I'm as things evolved over the years, I remember there was a time when I was writing a check or signing a check, actually. So a check was put on my desk because it was that time of the week to sign checks. And one of the checks was the payment to the federal government for this quarter's taxes. And I seem to remember it was 70 or $80,000. What's interesting about that story was you'd think that I'm telling a story called, oh my God, that was so scary and that was so terrifying. Actually, it was interesting because at that time, I had gotten things figured out and systematic enough that I could sign that check and know, yeah, we can afford this. And that's what's amazing. That's what's great is this is not a surprise. This has been essentially planned for, counted for. Um, this is all going according to plan, even though that was the largest check I'd ever written for taxes in my life. Right. So yeah. what what's possible for, for anyone out there that's like, Tim, oh my God, every quarter, I swear to God, it's like, my accountant comes after me and people are begging, you know, asking me those questions that I don't necessarily know the answers to. Uh, what's your encouragement or insight that you would give to us? Yeah, and so there's actually, there's a book out there called The E-Myth and this is some of the principles of The E-Myth. Um, to me, this is why I say this is the exciting part is, you know, if you're with a certain attitude, you can say, hey, I got into this to be a creative director and then all of a sudden I have to run a business, right? That's one way of kind of looking at it of what the business is taking away from me. But in reality, like the entrepreneurial mind wants to solve these problems and there are entrepreneurial solutions to it. It might not be in the, the creative field that you're in immediately, but something like paying taxes systematically, operationally, is something you can do. That's it's actually a, something you can tackle very easily. You can no, nothing more than just plan ahead with every check you receive. Simply put a portion of that into a checking account, and you can operationally have that eighty thousand dollars you need because it accumulated through those three months, and you made your quarterly payment, and it would accumulate again through uh, revenue and do it again. So there are actually ways in, that you can tackle this. My encouragement is, and what I love about some of these problems is the real asset you're building as a business owner are those systems and routines and putting those systems and routines into place. So it's the ability to have the machine run the machine is what you're really looking for. That's your ultimate goal. So when you're a little bit stressed and taking on a burden that you didn't sign up for, that's actually the moment of clarity of what your asset really needs to become. Mm. Hey, this is the moment where I can make my business be a business and have it run in a way that businesses should. And I can just be an investor and a business owner, but there are systems, routines, and processes to get to their side. And Joel, you pointed out, it's like bookkeepers already have systems and routines in place. So you just hire the bookkeeper. That's their entrepreneurial adventure to figure out why they're doing that, but you can employ people or you can invent your own like we do with production routines and, and sales routines. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. You just used the word there, investor. And that's often like a perspective that I've heard you encourage people to consider. I, I've done it as well, where if you look at your business and say, I'm just gonna pretend I'm an, if I was an investor in this business, rather than the creative, like, what do I see? how would I run this thing? And there, there's, uh, what is it, like a healthy detachment or something where you're able to say, oh, this actually isn't that hard of a problem. I can hire an expert. I can put a system and a routine in place. And right, we can look into the future and make decisions now. And as things play out, we kind of know if A happens, we, we're going to take this action. If B happens, we'll take that action. But it's all been essentially pre-decided right? We're going to pay our taxes. We know that much. Okay. Now what's the system and the routine that gets it done so that you can go back to work and be a creative. 
That's right. And you know, I've sat through, I don't know, umpteen million meetings now, it seems like, but um, many, many meetings where I was working with one of my clients and they're looking to pivot their business, sell it off, get investors and so on. And the questions that come in that meeting are ones that you want to have absorbed before and found solutions for before that meeting comes. It's really easy. I swear one of the first questions, every potential buyer asks every company they're buying, where do your sales come from? That's what they want to know. How do you generate sales? And I think one of the hardest answers and one of the worst answers you can give is, well, I'm the business owner. I just call my friends. You know what you have? You don't have an asset. You have a you have a mailing list and I have to buy you, not your business, right? Because I'm yeah. imagining the business running without you. So putting in sales routines, a sales pipeline, recognizing where money comes from, how those that those dollars are converted, and systematically putting those routines into place to convert those leads into projects without you, the business owner, having to be involved, that's an asset someone's going to buy. Um, taxes should not be a burden for you as a business owner. It's a part of the process. It happens every quarter and every year. It's something you can plan for on a week by week basis, a month by basis and quarter by quarter basis. And it can happen in very small pieces, often delegated to someone. You, you had the right moment there, Joel, like, and then you, the business owner signs the checks, but your team that's doing it, you, by the way, you can't abdicate this. I should be clear with that. You would have to, you just have to understand the ingredient and own the ingredient and do that ingredient, but you can delegate those that work to people. And then that's how your business turns into that asset. That's how that job you have turns in, you into an investor because yeah. that company is going to run itself and, and run through those systems and routines you put in place. Yeah. It, it um, by the way, Tim, I forgot to mention, we have to put the general disclaimer out there that we are not giving tax advice. <laughs> So Not at we, all. You'll, you'll hear us say that several times. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's interesting how when that routine was humming at my business, it was, for me, it was a pretty big accomplishment because again, I'm not the financial wizard. I don't enjoy spreadsheets and all that stuff, right? The operations and finance piece of it. But when I delegated that system and routine to an operations person at my company, and then I think it was, maybe it was every other week there would be a, a folder on my desk that said checks to sign. And yeah, that thing would be, there'd be 40 or 50 checks in that thing that I would have to sign. And what was interesting was going through it and it would be like, yes, sign it, sign it, sign it, sign it. Hmm. And just on an exception basis, once in a while I would say, hey, can you tell me more about this? But basically, you know, all but one or two checks would get signed and be on their way. And one of those, of course, was taxes. And I knew every time, yep, we're following that method that, that system that the, the accountant designed and my bookkeeper is just doing what she does and sign it. And the money is there. I know it's there because we earned the revenue. We have to pay the tax here. Off we go. Yeah. If you, if you're, um, for example, running through a cash flow system on a weekly basis, right. And you have, you can very easily do this on one of the spreadsheets we've made or anywhere else, every check that comes in, you can recognize that a percentage, 15% of that check, should be hitting a tax savings account. And on your cash flow, you can simply watch that money be moved every week, you know, every check into an accumulative tax account, and that money can sit there. Sometimes that's not the best business usage of that money to have it sit there for three months waiting for that tax payment. And if you're managing your cash flow well, you can integrate it in and invest it forward, still have the money needed to pay taxes, but use it and leverage the cash. But you know, same basic system, no matter how you're doing it. But I, you know, I'm a business owner also. I remember the day where the taxes were due or I'll say like my CPA prepared my, our taxes. And then I said to my wife and say, Hey, by the way, there's this bill that's due and that the money we've spent all last year didn't cover it. We have to find cash in the next three or four or five months, we'll, we'll make a payment to the IRS, but we'll make, we have to kind of like um, find the cash to do it. And that overwhelming feeling that I failed my family. Yeah. Not only did I feel like a fool in business, but I felt like I failed my family because I was doing something. It felt like I probably should have known better. Um, and I, one, I want to give everyone permission, like, it's okay if you didn't know better, right? That's how we actually learn. Sometimes we're learning from the moments that are in front of us. 
But what you don't want to do is repeat that. So how did this moment come and what can you do differently? That's the entrepreneurial side of this equation that we want to embrace. And that's the part we actually love. When we break down people's problems into seven ingredients, we've broken them down into seven major areas that you can master each one. And hopefully delegate all but the one or two that is your genius. Yeah, that you love to do. Right? Yeah. Exactly. I'm thinking, I'm thinking back to, yeah, because it's a little bit triggering. I'm thinking also of those early years when we started to make really good money. And then, and of course, April came around and it was like, oh my gosh, we got to come up with $40,000 and I don't have it. And then you start to learn that lesson and you say, okay. And now we're talking like profit first, right? That, that idea of that we preach, right? In the factors method called, we can actually take away profit. We can also take away taxes. From the jobs before we ever do the job and so it's never even given over to the producers to potentially overspend because if the producers are spending profit and spending taxes we're giving the clients way more than what they paid for yeah yeah and some you know some locations you don't just pay net tax or you don't pay tax on net gains sometimes you have to pay tax on gross receipts so not every not a lot of places but there are areas of los angeles for example and and in new york city where if the dollar came into your checking account you owe a, a percentage of that small percentage but a percentage of that in taxes regardless if you made profit or lost money wow. so you can't escape that part of it so there are there's a responsibility that we learn along the way or have professionals help us put those that recognition in place and capture it um, and again, now you can understand it. I think we're explaining, you explained it well there, Joel, of once you have that in place, you almost get that chance to let go. And that letting go is when that business became, that's when that job became a business and that business becomes an asset because the fact that you already made the system and the system works, it gets it, it gets the job done. So I, I just had a thought, maybe this translates. Do you know how we often use the metaphor of a car when we talk about right? Creating systems and routines and your headlights give you visibility, like a cash board and all this kind of stuff. I'm wondering, would, would cruise control almost be a metaphor for what letting go looks like? It's like, I'm not, I haven't actually let go of the wheel. I haven't, I haven't sat, I'm not sitting in the passenger seat and just letting the car drive itself. I've, but I've got my hand loosely on the wheel and the car is sensing, you know, what's ahead of me and whether or not it needs to tap the brakes, <laughs> if it yeah. needs to speed up, slow down. But there's that thought of, I set it, and then it does its thing. And then I look at the report, meaning speed, RPM, whatever. And that dashboard tells me, okay, we're doing good. But it's way different than me having to micromanage oh, yeah. every step of the way. Yeah, like a really basic um, vehicle, right? Is, you know, the pictures of the old guys like turning the crank to get the thing going, right? So it did turn over the engine, started the spark plugs and, and, and lit the fuel on fire. But now we have more sophisticated machines that we can sit in it, not even turn a key, press a button, and we expect it to run, right? Mm -hmm. We don't, we no longer with our sophisticated machines have to check every valve and every wire before we get into the vehicle every time. Um, we can, you know, we don't have to carry the gas with us. There are gas stations built along the way. And that and that whole like machine mechanism idea is how your business should be running as well. Let's talk about production, for example. You know, okay. in the production ingredient, the production element, jobs are awarded. They're actually already kind of, they're one ahead of time in sales. The, the production team often has a role in putting the bid together, putting some number, numbers together and the schedule, understanding some of the resources, the project's awarded. Once that project's awarded, you as a business owner should be able to hand that project over to an operation, a production operation system that knows how to take that bid, split it, direct and indirect costs, and then take those direct costs, understand the costs related to each of the tasks needed to get the job done, and then break down that job piece by piece and start the project, hiring the right people, scheduling the right people, getting them in place. And then on a weekly base basis, capturing the results and reprojecting that project until it's done and making profit. What we've learned by doing that, I, as easy as I can explain it, we have locked in profits for our clients over and over and over again. We've locked them in. We They're built into the machine, put one, capturing the profits in the indirect categories and, and the taxes and all those items in indirect. So no one's spending that money. 
but also giving some real clear parameters to the production team of what a successful project looks like, how much they can actually spend, and what are the real costs related to doing that so that they're not dealing with fake numbers and wondering if it's marked up and there's pad. No, get real costs out there. You, you've actually given that person responsibility and authority. And what do you need? You need a roll up. You need, you can look back at a dashboard and seeing is that person making successful decisions for me? I'm done. Right. right. As a business owner, I can watch it over and over again. And we see $187 million worth of dashboard roll ups on, you know, uh, in a year. So we're seeing those decisions successfully being built over and over again. That's just that one production ingredient. I can explain the same for a finance ingredient, a sales. You do sales, Joel. Mm -hmm. You know what sales is like, generating leads, putting into a pipe, pipeline, assessing those leads and capturing them, feeding those leads with a marketing system that's doing the outreach and moving people from unaware to aware. So each of these ingredients, that's the real machine. So these moments of aches and pains are really should be moments of inspiration to make us think, oh, I'm an entrepreneur. I should solve this problem entrepreneurially. Well, I, I totally agree. And I think it's a, it's a, is it, it is a, maybe a, a different way to spin it, right? Like when you feel that angst of like, this is annoying, this is frustrating, this is, right? Why does this have to be this way? I didn't sign up for this. To flip to the other side of that coin and say, okay, what's the opportunity here as an entrepreneur to think entrepreneurially? Is that a word? I know. It. I, I had to say that too. I was like, was that a word when I said that? <laughs> but yeah, think about it in a, in a new way and realize it's that it's that classic needs plus resources equals solution. So, okay, you, you know the need. It's acute, right? You feel that need acutely right now. So what's the resource? And in the case of taxes, it's probably a system and a routine. And now you know what you need to do. And then attacking these goals, you know, there there is a sometimes a recognition of it's who, not how. And sometimes it's how, not who, right? So you have to kind of recognize that at certain moments, I don't know how we're going to get it done, but I, Joel, I know you're the person I trust to do it. Can you please do this for me? I'll work with you. I'll support you. Nobody knows the solution. That let's, let's recognize you're the, the head of the team and I'll, I'll delegate to you. Well, I'll recognize what it takes to delegate to you. I'll tell you what a successful delegation looks like our successful execution looks like and the unsuccessful execution would be so that there's clear parameters of, of the result, but I'll give it to you. Other times that's abusive. Joel, mm -hmm. I don't want to do it. Can you just do everything for me? No, no, no. We actually have to get to the how part of it. It's how it's going to get done, not who. So if it's Joel or anyone else that replaces you, I can always have that machine running for me. Yeah. I'm wondering, is there, is there perhaps a a tendency, right, as a company evolves and grows, that it starts off, it's a much more of a who than a how. And then over time, it becomes much more a how than a who. Because if I'm a business owner, and I have 20 or 30 people working for me, and I someday say, hey, I'm ready to shift my role, step back, retire, sell, whatever, pass the torch. Clearly, I have processes, I have a, everything, there's a system to all these things, even the creative ingredient, which I know is anathema to many people, but every ingredient does have some sort of fundamental system and routine to it. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I do think like, obviously like when you start things off, it's a, it's a who proposition because it's you and yeah. your family, right? That's the entrepreneurial businesses. Everyone is either family or you call them family because it's asking for them to commit to something beyond a normal effort. But a large corporation, is, it has a hiring um, profile and a system to hire people to bring them in to do work. So clearly, there's positions that people can fill, and you are filling those positions. And that's where that, that asset-based uh, proposition is. I think the tipping point often is burnout. At least that's when we first see people, is they'll come to us and say, you know, to be honest, I'm just burned out. I don't want to do this again, or I don't want to repeat this over and over again. I'm tired. And that's when we say to them, let's talk about how it's going to get done, not who's going to do it, right? That's mm -hmm. burnout is a key moment we get to first see people, but you can proactively not burn out. So after we start working with clients, we teach them <clears throat> about what needs to happen moving forward, regardless if they are burned out or not. Like we're going to have to start moving this 
this ball into different directions and start hiring ahead of time, be proactive and build these systems and routines around it. Yeah, I mean, the, the owners that I am working with, I'm always listening for those early signs of burnout, right? It comes out in different ways and words and phrases, or maybe it's avoidance or, I don't know, procrastination, other things. And I would just encourage everyone, uh, just listen, right? Don't wait until it reaches that tipping point called, I'm just burned out, and then you blow something up, right? It's like, maybe you just need a good therapist to process things, but you might need to, to view things more entrepreneurially. And maybe too, Tim, there's an opportunity sometimes to invite that owner to get back in touch with, why did you start this in the first place? And maybe you stopped dreaming. Maybe you're, maybe you're in a rut and you're just not dreaming big enough. Yeah. Or you got really comfortable in this thing running you 15 years into it and you just wanted it to last 10 more years and it lasted three more years. So now what are you going to do? Right. Yeah. I, I mean, think my was, last, Oh God. I was just going to say there was definitely that sort of moment for me when I felt like every three years ish, there was sort of a repivot, a retool. And on the one hand, that was exciting. But after you do that over the period of 20 years, right. Am I reinventing for the sixth time now, the seventh time? I don't know. I lost track. Yeah. And that was part of what was behind my, hey, it's been 20 years. I think this is a good time to exit <laughs> yeah. because I don't think I want to reinvent one more time. But if that's you, if that's not you and you still have another 10 or 15 years to go, then yeah, it's time to figure this out. Which you can also solve that problem operationally. Like the mm -hmm. machine can make the machine. You just have yourself in the middle and you're right. Time basically expired. But my last encouragement in this process of turning your, your business into an asset is make sure technology follows technique. And I say that so often, I want people to understand it. We often think this, we, we want the solution to be in a piece of technology. So we say, oh no, no, I'm gonna get rid of that production tool. And now I'm bringing this production tool in place. And now all my production will be more profitable. And the reality is like, you, know, you didn't solve anything, but change the fields people are typing the wrong information into. <laughs> um, right. So the technique part of it is, I often think of, you should be able to do almost everything with a piece of paper and a pen. Technology just speeds it up, right? So the fact that things are digital means that I don't have to spend the time copying it manually or even you know, auto mechanically. I can just digitally distribute it. All technology works that way. It can filter things faster, report things better, add more assessment and clarity to it. Technology has a lot of power to it, but it's garbage in, garbage out. And if you haven't yeah. mastered the technique of what you're trying to accomplish, or as you said before, the why, why you're doing it, then what you get out of it is not the result you're going to, that you wanted to. So you have to program that machine properly. So technology has to follow technique and just know that sit down with your team, ask them how they already do it. Make, find some technology that complements the systems and routines you already have in place or add a routine to your system. So there's a checks and balances. People put data into a database, have to take some time to read that data, read the reports, analyze those reports and understand what needs to be improved. So you're making proactive decisions to keep the all going. So I, this could apply to taxes maybe, but I'm gonna give one example because I'm thinking of an owner that I'm work, working with and, and we decided, hey, it's time for you to delegate uh, the AR process, right? It's time to get this off your plate. And so I said, all right, I'm going to have you teach it to me and we're going to record it and transcribe it, but I'm going to play completely dumb, which, which actually wasn't yeah, entirely, entirely have, untrue, yeah, AR, yeah. <laughs> which, you know, and it was like, oh, I go here, I fill in this thing. I, you know, I send this email to the bookkeeper and then I put this on the roll up and I go back to the original budget. And I, and it was like, oh my God, this is 27 step process that's in her head. And as we captured it, it was like, okay, now all the raw material of it is there because you taught it to somebody clueless. Now we can hand that to the bookkeeper and say, hey, we're adding this to your routine, put it in place. And it's, it's a beautiful example of you can get all of these things that you think, oh, it, it's just so hard for me to explain it. It's just quicker if I do it myself. Don't believe that lie. Over the long term, that's only going to backfire on you. Yeah. Either you've made it difficult to keep yourself employed, because we do do that to ourselves, right? We Sure. We say, I have, to, I have to feel important, so I better make this really difficult so I can stay important, yeah. um, which is just a trap that we put ourselves into. Or if it is that complicated, there is a skill to it, and that's an asset. You should be able to convert that skill into a value for yourself and your company. 
Uh, by the way, I should mention uh, we're about at our 30 minute mark and we try to respect the, the clock. So we should wind this down. Everyone's been here like quietly listening. So either people don't want to raise their hands and look stupid or, or they know that they can go into the community and drop a question there and privately, right? Uh, the community of owners will process it. So I should just mention if, uh, if you're here and you're not a member of that community, we certainly invite you to, to join. It's only business owners and it's private. So go, uh, it's at revthink.com slash community. And I think we cleaned up the whole, like how people join and everything. So if you've tried in the past and it, <laughs> it didn't work or something, it should be pretty clean and simple how you, how you join that. Yeah, really simple now. Put, give us your email address. To give, you'll be sent a link. That link is a hot link. It takes you right to the community and you can sign right in. So yeah, there's, there's like two or three th threads that happened this week that I've just got busy and wasn't in the community. But several people were saying, hey, Joel, what do you think about this? And what do you think about that? I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. And I went into the community and said, holy cow, these threads are blowing up. People are really passionate and have a lot of opinions to share about all these issues related to running a business. So yeah, I love it. Our community is truly one of the uh, fun things we can do on a weekly basis. Yeah, it's beautiful. Good questions. So. All right. Well, I'm going to sign this off, Tim. Thank you for uh, this briefing. Thanks to everybody for, who is here. And uh, good to see everyone uh, joining here weekly. We'll see you next week, Tim. Until then, have a great rest of your week. Thanks, Joel. Be safe. Okay. Bye, everybody. Later.